Okay, so what I'm doing here uh, is basically replaying the video and talking over uh, to add audio because I made a mistake and didn't have the settings correct the first time. So there might be a little lag or it might seem incongruous, but this won't happen again, okay, in, the, in any other videos that I happen to make. All right, so let's go ahead and I'm going to start playing. Basically, you just want to read this. What we're doing is we're proving that Q is dense in R. Okay, so what this means is that in between any two real numbers, there's always a rational number. Okay. So I don't know what I was saying, but All right, looks like I'm about to write. Um, okay, so to start the proof, uh, the basic strategy would be to suppose that you have two real numbers, A and B. And uh, suppose that A is strictly less than B. Then our goal is to show that there exists a rational number in between A and B. But every rational number is of the form M over N, right? Where M and N are integers. Um, and we can actually assume that n is a positive integer because if m over n is a negative number, then we can just let m be negative and n be positive, right? So, of course, n is not going to be equal to zero. Now, once we have that we want a less than m over n less than b, just uh, cross multiply and say that's the same set of inequalities as assuming that n times a is less than m and m is less than n times b. So we're able to rewrite our goal as showing there exists m and n, right? So it suffices to show that there exists Let's erase that. Okay. So it suffices to show that there exists an integer m and a positive integer n such that n times a is less than m and m is less than n times b. Okay, so the first part of the proof is going to rely on, excuse me, showing that there exists a positive integer n such that n times a is less than n times a plus 1 is less than n times b. And we use the Archimedean property. And so how do we know that such an N exists? Well, we're going to use the fact that B minus A, which is the distance between A and B, is positive. So B minus A is positive. So the Archimedean property implies that there is always a positive integer whose, uh, 
whose reciprocal is in between 0 and B minus A. So right here, I'm just drawing a diagram to show that we start off with A and B, uh, and A is less than B. And what we're saying is that in our picture here, N times A is going to be, of course, less than N times A plus 1, but then N times A plus 1 is going to be less than N times B. So we'll correct that, and that'll be N times B. So N times B, okay. And notice that the picture that we've drawn is making an assumption about A and B. It's assuming that A is a positive number. But of course, the statement of our theorem does not assume that A is positive. It just says A and B are any real numbers. So you could be in a situation where A is negative. And in this case, N times A is gonna be less than A that's fine too, right? We'll just use this top picture to give us an idea of what our quantities in our proof mean. Okay, you also could have n, you could have a and b both less than zero. So there are actually three cases, depending on whether zero is less than a, in between a and b, or greater than b. So the distance between A and B is B minus A. So that's a positive number. Remember, distance is always positive. And the Archimedean property of real numbers tells us that every real number greater than zero um, has a positive integer whose reciprocal is squeezed in between that real number and zero. Okay, and now we just uh, multiply both um, inequalities by n and rearrange, and we end up with what we wanted originally, which is the, um, the existence of a positive integer that's so big that it doesn't matter how close a and b are, we can at some point, you know, some point down the number line, get to a place where the distance between n times b and n times a is more than 1. So that's the key here is that n times a and n times b have to be more than one unit apart from each other because, you know, n times a and n times a plus 1 are going to be one unit apart, right? So this is one unit, and then you'll have that little extra piece from n a plus 1 to n times b. So this distance has to be greater than one. And now we know that integers, because remember our whole goal is to try to find some integer m that is in between n times a and n times b. So the integers are spaced out by one unit, right? Negative three, negative two, negative one, da da da. So if we've got n a and n b more than one unit apart, the idea is that we have to we have to have an integer in between n a and n b. Okay, so we know that, right? But the key here, um, the task before us is to prove it, and proving it is going to rely on the completeness axiom because it relies on the Archimedean property, which relies on the completeness axiom. Okay, I might start editing these videos because I can't imagine what I was saying. You know, I am long-winded. I'm aware of that. Like, what was I saying? I don't know. <laughs> okay, all right. <clears throat> Moreover, the Archimedean property implies that 
Oh yeah, so the Archimedean property is going to imply that there's an integer which allows us to kind of encapsulate NA and NB. So we it's don't know where... The clock. Thank you. We don't know where NA and NB are on the number line. We just know that NA is less than N times B. But we know that there's some integer where NA and NB are both contained within negative K and K. Okay. So now how do we know that? Well, remember, for whatever number you, whenever you have a real number, the Archimedean property um, implies that there's always an integer bigger than your real number, right? And so we can just kind of play around with the inequalities um, to get that there's always a negative integer less than your real number as well. So we'll see how to, how to work with that now. So remember, NB is a real number, so that means that there exists K1, which is a positive integer, where K1 is bigger than the absolute value of N times B. But the absolute value of N times B is always bigger than N times B, right? And there also exists a K2, where K2 is greater than the absolute value of N times, that should be N times A. Okay, yeah, yeah, N times A. Okay. So if we just let K be the maximum of K1 and K2, or we could let K be K1 plus K2, or K1 plus K2 plus 1, there are many ways to get a number that's going to be bigger than both the absolute value of N times B and the absolute value of n times a. And now, n times b is always less than or equal to its absolute value, which is less than k. Okay, so that gives us one of the inequalities. And n times a is going to be bigger than negative absolute value of n times a. Let's see. Okay, that's true, but I don't know how that's relevant. N times A is less than or equal to the absolute value. No, Tonchi. No, go away. So N, here we go. Yeah, N times A is bigger than or equal to. No, strictly bigger than. No, it's bigger than or equal to. Negative absolute value of n times a, and that's going to be bigger than negative k because we set up k to be bigger than the absolute value of n times a. So now we've got the back end of our uh, string of inequalities, right? So we hook them together because we know that n times a is going to be n times a is less than n times b. And so we have those three, one, two, three inequalities, right? So in a situation like that, um, <clears throat> because this is such a, a long proof, I wrote I wrote that step out or I explained this step, right? I explained the fact that there exists a K satisfying this as kind of a little sidebar, right? Because it's small in comparison to the whole setup of the proof. But if you're in a Say if your only question is prove that there exists a K satisfying this property, then you you know you can go ahead and dig down and prove all of that. Okay, so we've got K, we've got our uh, integer K, and we're looking at negative K to K. Uh, we can look at the set of integers in between negative K and K, and so we form this set big K, and it's the set of integers that fall between negative K and K. 
Now this set is finite. In fact, we know exactly how many elements it has. The size of this set is going to be 2k plus 1, right? Assuming that k is not equal to 0. Well, no, even if k is equal to 0, it'll still be 2k plus 1. So we know it's a finite set. We know it is non-empty. It's non-empty because k is in our set k. All right, and I'm just showing you here how you can, um, you know, just rewrite it in several different ways, right, just to emphasize that it is a finite set. Because remember, finite sets have min, minima, finite ordered sets have min and max, minima and maxima. So we know that the minimum of k exists, the maximum of k exists. And so the idea is that we want to look at the integers, right, in k that are bigger than n times a. And if we look at the integers in our set k that are bigger than n times a, we'll pick the smallest integer that is bigger than n times a, but less than or equal to k, and that will be the m that we want, you know, for our proof. Okay. Because it'll be an integer and it'll have to be in between n times a and n times b. So that's what we want to be our m. The perfect candidate. Okay, so let's look at that set. And we want the set of points in k that are strictly larger than n times a. This is going to be a finite set. Why is it finite? It's finite because it's a subset of k. It's also non-empty. Why is it non-empty? Because it contains the point k. So that means that the minimum of it, sorry, Yeah, so I was saying that this k, since this k is in k and its k is bigger than a sub n, right, we know that our set here is non-empty. So we're going to define m to be the minimum of that set of points in k that are strictly greater than n times a. And so now what we need to show is that m is less than n times b. <coughs> so we claim that this choice of m satisfies n times a is less than m is less than n times b. And just as a refresher, m is going to be defined as the minimum of the integers in k that are strictly greater than n times a. So already by definition, by def definition of our set, since m belongs to this set, m has to be strictly greater than n times a. So the tricky part is showing that m, m is less than n times b.
Okay, so we're saying we know that M is bigger than or equal to Let's see. So let's see. Wait, wait. Okay, so we want to show that m minus 1 is in k. Now we know that m minus 1 is less than or equal to k. Um, why is m minus 1 less than or equal to k? Well, because m minus 1 is less than m, and m is less than or equal to k, right? Since m belongs to k. So the first uh, inequality is easy. The second inequality, however, is a little trickier. So if we want to show that negative k is less than or equal to m minus 1, let's see, how are we going to do that? Okay, so we know that m is strictly bigger than n times a because m is the minimum of that set of integers in k that are strictly bigger than n times a. So that means that m has to be strictly bigger than n times a. But we also know that m is an integer. So Since m and negative k is an integer, so if m is bigger than negative k, since they're both integers, that means that m is bigger than or equal to negative k plus 1, right? So um, again, that's because m and negative k are both integers. So now we just rearrange and we get that m minus 1 is bigger than or equal to negative k. So since m minus 1 is, in, is an integer that's in between negative k and k, it must be that m minus 1 is in k. And now, since m minus 1 is in k, and m minus 1 is strictly less than m, which is the minimum of that set, it must be that m minus 1 is less than or equal to n times a. It's 12, 15. Thank you. It's 12, 15. Okay, so since m minus 1 is strictly less than the minimum of that set and m minus 1 belongs to k, it must be that m minus 1 is less than or equal to n times a.
And so then we can just rearrange. And this tells us that m is bigger than or equal to, sorry, m is less than or equal to 1 plus n times a. So m is less than n times b. All right, that's it.